songs are special. You can remember where you were when you heard them for the first time. About five years ago, I grew, drove a group of college kids to Passion in Atlanta. Never heard this song before, but it's one of those songs that just reaches out and grabs your heart. I'm writing down lyrics and names because I'm thinking my congregation needs to sing this. If you know the verses, sing them with me. If you don't, just listen. Let us pray. The most gracious and heavenly Father, God, we are here to praise your holy name. God, we're thankful for the sin of your son on the cross to die for our sins, God. And we're thankful to have the privilege to be able to come to your house, God, and just lift up our praise and our, and our worship to you this morning. And God, I pray that we do that in a way that glorifies
glorifies you, God. I pray that you bless every word that is said here. And I pray that you bless everything that is thought here, God. And we do all this to honor you this morning. For us in your name we pray. Amen. It's great to see you in the house of the Lord this morning. A lot better crowd this week than it was last week on the holiday. We do apologize last week for uh, the streaming services. Uh, we did not get that done last week. And we apologize. But we're going to take just a few minutes this morning just to welcome each other. So if you haven't had a chance to speak to someone, take just a few moments to turn and say good morning. And then we'll come back together and worship again this morning. So take just a few moments to wave at each other and uh, tell each other good morning this morning. next one. You know, I, if you, I have been here but two or three weeks. I am never going to do a service that doesn't include hymns. Uh, I was amazed several years ago we had a lady in our church who had Alzheimer's, was in the nursing home, and she would come and go so quickly. One minute she didn't know her husband's name or her kid's name, and the next minute she knew everybody's name. But I noticed in the nursing home when we do a hymn sing once a month, she knew verse 2, verse 3, verse 4 of every hymn. That part of her brain was still intact, and she was, her mind had totally gone, but those hymns were there as a rich treasure for her to pull from. So I love the old hymns, and this is one of the oldest in the hymnal. The truth and theology is so deep. Sing it with me. You know it. My faith has found a resting place.
in challenging times, but the body of Christ has proven itself resilient. We've gathered in different ways, in different places, yet stood steadfast as the church. We have found peace in God's promise to never leave us or forsake us. In our separation, we have remained united. In our struggle, we have lived out our faith. In the midst of the unknown, we have leaned on the strength of an all-knowing God. Throughout history, the church has thrived in adversity, and this moment is no different. The power of God is unstoppable, His love unending, His grace unrelenting, His glory undeniable. Today, no matter where we gather, we remain God's people. Our mission has not changed. Our calling has not been altered. And nothing, absolutely nothing, will ever change that. We are the church, and today we stand resilient. Talked about impactful songs. I understand that one of your former ministers of music was a member of the Alabama Singing Men. I've been in that group for 22 years. And we had done a tour in South Mississippi, and I was coming back across the state of Alabama on little county roads when I heard Laura Story's song, Blessings. And I wanted to hear it again immediately. And there was no cell phone service, no gas stations open. It was 3 in the morning, and this song comes over the radio. I'll never forget that song. I immediately knew that it was written out of great tragedy, great sorrow. You don't, just don't sit down and write a song like that. This song we're going to sing next, I had left Flowers Hospital after visiting church members. And I've always enjoyed that part of ministry. I just, I never shied away from being in the hospital. Uh, I like being by people and praying with them and, and helping them through the tough times of life. Uh, you kind of have to bear your soul. Pastor and I probably have seen and been by the bedside of more dying people than second only to a physician. I can't tell you how many people I've watched take their last breath and prayed them into glory. It's tough. It takes an emotional toll on you. And I had one of those days was leaving Flowers Hospital, and this song came over the radio, and it blessed me to the point where I couldn't drive. I had to just pull over on the shoulder and worship with it, just lift my hands and say, thank you, God, I needed this song today. This song, a lot of the contemporary songs will not be around in 10 or 15, 20 years. This one will. Stand with me. Let's sing 10,000 Reasons together. <laughs> Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul, worship his holy name, sing like never before, O oh my soul, I'll worship your holy name. The sun up. It's a new day dawning. It's time to sing your song again. Whatever may pass and whatever lies before me, let me be singing when the evening comes. Bless the Lord. his holy name sing like never before oh my soul i'll worship your holy name you're rich in love and you're slow to anger your name is great and your heart is kind for all your goodness I will keep on singing ten thousand reasons for my heart to find bless
day. Don't know when that day is. And on that day when my strength is failing, the end draws near and my time has come. Still my soul will sing your praise unending. Ten thousand years and then church. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul. Worship his holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul. I'll worship your holy name. Sing it again. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh soul worship his holy name sing like never before oh my soul I'll worship your holy name be seated please amen Good morning. Isn't it a great day to be in the house of the Lord? After last Sunday, I'm just glad to be here. Uh, not being able to uh, come to church, uh, not being able to preach. Um, I have to say that uh, my wife, uh, she likes the Hallmark Channel. Some of you like that? <laughs> In my house, we have watched, uh, uh oh, I'm in trouble. Uh, I've watched too many uh, Hallmark Christmas in July shows this, this past week, so, so I'm glad to, glad to be here. But to, we're thankful for your prayers and uh, your encouragement, and uh, we, we're feeling great and doing fine, and, and uh, so glad to be here today. Uh, real quickly, I, I want to just ask you to keep praying for Brother Ben. Uh, uh, text with him a little bit yesterday, and uh, he he is still um, weak, uh, still real sore uh, due to his surgery. And um, he said that they drew off uh, ten more liters off of him the other day. So uh, uh, we just really need to continue to pray for him and thank you for the way that you have responded uh, in love offering for him. And uh, if you have not. Uh, given toward that and would like to, uh, I believe that our office will pr probably still be willing to, uh, to take any love offering that you'd like to give, but we'll get that to him. But uh, he, he wanted to be here today, but uh, just, just not able. He was just going to slip in and worship with us. But uh, uh, we're so thankful for Brother Bruce and his wife being with us. Uh, they're a blessing to us, and we appreciate them being willing uh, to fill in during this time. So uh, if you... Uh, don't go get up in their face, but uh, wave at them and tell them how much we, we appreciate them. Well, this morning I want you to take your Bibles and I want you to turn over to Romans. Uh, the book of Romans chapter 5, we've been uh, looking uh, in the book of Romans and we'll continue to look through the book of Romans uh, for the unforeseeable future unless uh, something uh, else the Lord lays on my heart. Uh, I like expository preaching. Uh, expository preaching is verse by verse. And uh, I think that's the best way to grow people. I think it's the best way to grow a church is the expository preaching. So uh, we're going to continue in Romans uh, chapter 5. Uh, we're going to focus on verses 1 through 5. So when you found that portion of Scripture, would you stand with me in honor and in reverence to reading God's Word? Romans chapter 5, beginning with verse 1. 
Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith into the grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, and perseverance character, and character hope. Now hope does not disappoint, because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. Let's pray together. Father, we bow our lives before you. You are worthy of all of our worship. You're worthy of all of our praise. And I pray that this morning that the Holy Spirit would move and touch and speak to every heart and every mind in this place. And Father, we thank you that the promise that you made to us, that when two or three are gathered in your name, that there you will be also. We thank you for being with us. And Father, I pray that this morning that you'd have your hand on my life. Father, I pray that you'd give me the boldness. I pray that you'd give me the authority to stand, to proclaim and preach your word this morning. And I pray that it will not return void. I pray that all of us will listen, that we'll make the application of it in our lives, and that we're going to leave this place a little bit later different people than when we came in today. We pray and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, I think it's appropriate that when we're facing life-altering decisions to evaluate those decisions very carefully. It's likewise appropriate for people to ask, uh, why should I put my trust in Jesus Christ? Folks, putting your faith and your trust in Jesus Christ, it is the single most important decision that you and I will ever make. And you need to be deliberate when you make that decision. Now, as we're looking at this morning in Romans chapter 5, what you find is that the Apostle Paul, he can, uh, continues the uh, definition of the Christian life. And he's listing some of the benefits of being declared not guilty by God. Listen, we as Baptists, we ought to get a little bit excited when we read about that, listen, that we can stand before God and that we're not guilty. Nobody. You know, Paul seems to anticipate the human tendency to ask, what's in it for me? Well, if you have worked uh, for any length of time, uh, some of you have worked with corporations and other businesses, and one of those things when you take a job, you want to know what your benefits are, right? You want to know how many vacation days you're going to have. Uh, you're going to want to know if you get your birthday off. You want to know if they're going to contribute to your 401k or have some type of retirement program. Uh, you want to know what the benefits are, right? Listen, when, when you and I put our faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, you and I need to understand that there's some benefits to that. We have benefits as a part of being the, in the family of God. And uh, Paul is trying to help us to understand this morning about those benefits. And there's four of them that are listed here in the verses that we've read and looked at together. The first one that Paul wants us to see is this. One of the benefits of putting our faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ is that you and I have peace with God. And that is an awesome thing. It ought to make some Baptists get some, a little bit excited about that. But we have peace with God. And Paul begins chapter 5 with the word, therefore. Uh, I had a pastor in my life a very short period of time, Dr. N.B. Langford, used to be at First Baptist Panama City. 
And uh, I remember when Dr. Langford, when he would preach and he'd come to a therefore, he would say, you need to find out what the therefore is there for. And uh, you think about that, you own it. it. It makes really good sense. But this means that he's drawing a conclusion here. He's been talking about justification by faith uh, through Jesus Christ, and Paul has urged us to trust God's power, to trust His power to remove our sin, to raise us to new life through the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And Paul tells us that trusting Jesus is the way that will bring us to peace with God. Now, in many ways, the other three benefits of justification that we're going to look at this morning really are just kind of an application of this idea of having peace with God. Now, the Bible tells us that before we are justified, that we are at war with God. Now, you think about that for just a moment. Before we put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ and we're saved through the blood of the Lamb, then the Bible tells us that we're at war with God. You say, well, I've, I've never shot at God and I've never wanted to be against God. But see, sometimes many people just want to be neutral. Listen, you can't be neutral between the world and Jesus Christ. You're either for Him or you're against Him. But you and I need to understand that we are at war with God before we put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ. You say, well, what are you talking about, preacher? I'm glad you asked because I'm going to tell you. Listen, what that means is that uh, sometimes we rebel against His rule in our life, don't we? Y'all shake your head. We rebel. In other words, we want to do what we want to do. We've got self on the throne of our lives. You see, when we come to faith in Jesus Christ, that means that, listen, we have laid down our weapons and we have surrendered to Him and we belong to Him. But sometimes we resist His ways too, don't we? We know that God wants us to go a certain direction and we know that God wants, to, wants us to do something uh, specific but we determine that we're not going to do it. We determine, we resist what God has to say to us. And basically what it is, is we've come to that place where we want the universe to revolve around us. We're so selfish. But you see, you and I have got to understand something. God hates sin. God hates sin, and because He is a just and holy God, He has to punish sin. And when God punishes sin, He must do it with a fierce wrath. Now, justification through Christ, it ends those hostilities. God's wrath is then satisfied in the death of the perfect Son, of God. Matter of fact, I don't know if any of you watch uh, CNN. Uh, that's not my channel of choice. But I did notice that Don Lemon, uh, one of their um, uh, commentators, made the statement that uh, Jesus wasn't perfect. He said that Jesus admittedly wasn't perfect. Now, I don't know where Don Lemon gets his information from, but he can't be more wrong. Listen, Jesus was the perfect salvation, I mean, the, the perfect sacrifice for our salvation. So, uh, just so that you know where I stand, uh, Don Lemon doesn't know what he's talking about. Uh, yeah, well, you just, uh, you decide. There you go. How about that? You do your research on that. But, you know, his resurrection, it shows that his sacrifice that it was acceptable to God. It, it, was, it was perfect. It was everything that was needed to pay for our sin. But I want you to notice something. That when we turn to Jesus Christ, we're no longer at war with God. We can turn to Him. But I want you to notice this. 
This peace with God is not given to everybody. It's only to the person who has been justified by faith, as the Scripture says here, that we can have true peace with God. You will not find peace with God apart from Jesus Christ. Those who are trying to find peace on their own, I'm just going to tell you they're going to fail. You can meditate all you want to. You can protest war. Listen, you can work in the Peace Corps, and you can take drugs or whatever, but you're never going to get to a place where you're at peace with God without first going through the Lord Jesus Christ. But there's a second benefit that I don't want you to miss, and that is that because of Jesus Christ, Paul is teaching us here that, listen, that we've got access to God. We've got access to God. Now look at verse 2. He says, Through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand. Now, from the time Adam and Eve were kicked out of the Garden of Eden, what you find is that men and women have been denied access with God, uh, the, the intimate access that Adam and Eve had. Now, go back with me into the Old Testament. You remember that in the temple uh, there was a veil there, a veil that stood between the holy place and the holy of holies. The people were not granted access to God. That certain, effectively, uh, that, that curtain, it, it effectively said, well, keep out. You see, before Jesus Christ, we had to go through a priest. But now, because of what Jesus Christ did on the cross, listen, when he, was, when he took his last breath, uh, you remember there was an a, um, earthquake that took place? And what happened in the temple itself was that the top part of the curtain that is split all the way down to the bottom. Do you think that was just because of uh, the results of the earthquake? I don't think so. God did it. God took that curtain and he ripped it in two. And folks, there's a message in that. The message in that is it because of what Jesus Christ did on the cross, that means that you and I, we have access to God. We can come boldly to His throne of grace. And, and folks, before Jesus did what He did on the cross, we didn't have that kind of access. When Jesus died and satisfied the wrath of God, that curtain was torn from the top to the bottom. And that showed that, listen, we now have access to God. Now, Paul tells us that we've gained access to grace. Now, the word for access that he uses here has the picture of Jesus bringing us into the presence of the Father. You know, some of you that have a, a, a larger family, and uh, maybe you're trying to get together for a, a family portrait picture. Y'all with me? Y'all smile at me. Well, you can't, can you? <clears throat> Y'all, uh, give me one of those. Um, you with me? All right. And, and you're getting all your family together for a picture, and, and you've got little, uh, little Sam over here. You're trying to get him to quit squirming, and, and you've got uh, another one over here and over here, and you're trying to get everybody in the right place. But uh, you're, you're busy doing that, and, and, and you want things just right. You see... What's happening there is you, you, you're getting everything right. You, you're, you're getting ready for the access. Now, because of the Son, you and I are accepted. Don't, don't lose this. Because of Jesus, you and I, we have been accepted. Where we probably wouldn't have been accepted. Now, I know that Jeff King and Missy, they've got a few boys, don't they? And I can imagine that through the time that uh, your sons have most likely brought a friend home. Am I right? They've probably brought a friend home, and, and it could be that they may have brought one home from college, and maybe y'all didn't know that he was bringing one, right? 
and uh, he brings a friend and uh, uh, he's planning to stay with uh, your family. Uh, most of us, uh, if they came with one of our children, we probably wouldn't think a whole lot about it. We might ask them, well, where are you from and who's your mom and daddy and what your mom and daddy do? But we probably wouldn't have any problem having that, that friend come and stay in your home. But listen, if your son were to uh, not be there and the person just shows up and says, hey, I'm such and such and I want to stay in your home. How many of you would let that person stay in your home? Absolutely you wouldn't. You don't know if they're an ax murderer. You don't know anything about them. And uh, listen, because we don't know them, we wouldn't let them in and we certainly wouldn't let them stay in our house. But because your son has a friend and you, he brings the friend to stay in your home. Listen, because of your son, that friend has access. You follow me? You, the friend has access. He comes and stays in your home and he eats your food and he hangs out with your family. You see, I'm sharing that to make the point that because of Jesus Christ, listen, when we're with him, we have access to the Father. That's what he's talking about here. Now, the word that Paul uses for stand right here in verse 2, uh, I'm not an English uh, expert, but, but I do know that this was written right here. This was written in present tense. And you say, well, what difference does that make? What that may, means is this. This means that this standing, that it's not something that's sporadic, but it's something that's it's continuous. It's not just a one-time visit. We, we have a continuous access to God, and we've been granted the access that comes from being a son. Now, we're invited to enter into his presence at any time. We don't have to make any appointments. Uh, if you were to call the White House or the Capitol today and say, hey, I'm coming up on Wednesday and I want to be able to see President Trump. How many of you think that you can make that kind of call and you're going to get access to the President of the United States? You're going to have to jump through a whole lot more hoops than that, and you probably won't ever get to see unless she's passing by. You see, with God, because of Jesus Christ, we don't have to go through a president. We don't have to go through a pope or a priest. Listen, we can come to the very presence of God. We have access to God. That is one of the benefits that you and I have. But there's another one. And that is this. Joy and hope of the glory of God. We have joy and the hope of what's ahead for us. Now Paul tells us in verse 3 and 4 that because of our justification through faith, pick up with me, it says, We also glory in tribulations... Knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, and perseverance character, and character hope. You see that? You see, when we trust Jesus for our salvation, we're able to look past this world, and we can look with anticipation of what we've got to look forward to. Listen, we can get excited thinking about one day we're going to be able to put our hands in those nail-scarred hands. We can get excited because one day we're going to be able to look at Jesus face to face and our eyes are going to be, be able to make contact with His. You remember when you were a child and how you used to anticipate Christmas? Uh, one of our grandsons, Griffin, uh, if Christmas was every week, he could be excited about that. He loves Christmas. I mean, he's already thinking about Christmas. He's already thinking about decorating the tree. He's already thinking about gifts. And he, he's just so excited about Christmas. It may be months away, but he's already dreaming about it. 
He's already thinking about finding those presents under the tree. You see, that's what you call anticipation. He has anticipation. And folks, you and I ought to have this same thing. We ought to have anticipation about going to heaven one day. Uh, can I break some news to you? Can I just tell you that this is not heaven we're living in? This is not heaven. This is not all there is. Folks, what you and I have got to look forward to is something far beyond what we've got here. When we get to heaven, everything's going to be perfect, and it's going to be awesome. But folks, you and I, we can have anticipation of that. We can get excited about that. Now, I'm not suggesting that you've got to get in a rush, but what I am saying that is for believers, you and I, we ought to have anticipation that, listen, this is not all there is, and we can look forward to going to heaven one day. You know, sometimes I think that we lose sight of this hope. We lose sight of it. Suppose that you were to take your family to Disney World. And let's say that your son, he spends the first hour just looking at his feet. When he gets on the monorail, he's not looking around, he's just looking at his feet. When he comes in the gate and he sees Cinderella's castle, he's not looking at the castle, he's looking at his feet. And finally you say, why are you spending so much time looking at your feet? And his reply is, well, I just don't want to trip and have to leave Disney World. What would you say? I'd say, listen, forget about the tripping part. If you fall down, you can get back up. But don't miss all this that's available. Don't, don't miss seeing all this. Look around and see how great this place is. Many people live the Christian life this way. They're only just looking at their feet. They're only concerned about making sure that they don't step in a pothole over here or trip into something over here, and they're missing it. They're missing all that's available, not just when we get to heaven, but for here and now. They're afraid of messing up. Listen, if, if you're so afraid of messing up, then you're not going to be able to see and enjoy not only what's around you now, but what's available to you when you get to heaven one day. But there's one more benefit, and I know you're just sitting on the end of the pew there. You were waiting to get to this fourth one, but here it is. The fourth benefit of being justified by faith through Jesus Christ is to listen, that you and I can have joy in the tribulations of life. Now, this is deep. You may want to really listen to this because it's not a matter of if, it's a when. Because every one of us, at some point in life, we're going to face some problems and some difficulties in life. So it's a, it's a win. It's going to happen. So because of this new perspective and not looking at just our feet, in life and looking in light that listen heaven is on the horizon we've got a whole different attitude toward the trials of life Paul says that we can rejoice even in the tribulation I say you're a preacher that's that's easy to preach about but it's a whole nother thing to live it and I, and I know that's true but look with me again at verse 3 through 5 and not only that but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, and perseverance character, and character hope. Now, hope does not disappoint. That's a whole sermon right there. Hope does not disappoint, because the love of God has been poured out in the hearts, in our hearts, by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. Now, the word for tribulations uh, right there, it carries the picture of a press that's squeezing the fluid uh, out of a grape or, or 
or maybe some of you remember back in the 60s when the orange industry of 50s and 60s when the orange industry really took off remember everybody had to go out and buy one of those orange squeezers remember that but this is the idea of what that tribulation means. You know, life can be that way sometimes. It's like it's pressing you. It's just squeezing you from every angle in life. And folks, there's some real trials, some real tribulations that we go through. When we're persecuted for our faith or we face some kind of tragic, a tragic situation. But even though these things are painful, as children of God, we can rejoice in it because we believe that God has a purpose for allowing those things into our lives. Through Christ, we've come to trust God and we know that He's in control and we know that He loves us and we know that God never makes a mistake. Consequently, in the hard times, we rejoice because we know that God is up to something, that God is doing something that's for His glory and is for our good. We have the confidence that when we get to heaven, that, listen, we're going to see God's purpose and we're going to thank Him for our lives and we're even going to thank Him for the hard times. The word perseverance, it means to endure. To endure. Uh, I was going to bring this out if, if Coach Crawford was here this morning, but you know, uh, one of the things as coaches, and I remember playing myself, that listen, when you're, when you're going through those two a days uh, leading up to football season, uh, that coach is trying to determine whether you are the kind that will persevere or not. See, he doesn't want put, uh, to put people in the game that's only going to play half the game. He, he wants to put people in the game that are going to, to be there for the very last snap of the game, regardless of whether the score is out of hand or not. That coach, he wants to know your character and know whether you're going to give up or whether you're going to persevere. Now listen, there's too many of us as believers that listen, that uh, when difficult times come and, and we have to run some, some uh, wind sprints, so to speak, in life, that we're not going to give up. I see too many people give up. Too many people give up in their faith. They give up in church. We all know people that used to go, but listen, the CIA can't even find them now. Persevering. But from perseverance, you get character. And, uh, and I'm not saying I'm a better uh, at translating the Scripture than... The, uh, the writer, but I'll say this, I think maybe one that, uh, that you and I can get is proven character. That is proven. The Greek word actually means proof. It was the word that was used to test the purity of metals and the difficult times. Listen, it separates those who have genuine faith and those that just profess faith. When we faithfully persevere in the pressing times of life, we prove that we have genuine faith. It, it means that our faith, that it's got integrity. Now, it's possible this morning that you're here in this service or you're listening to it online, but you lack peace. Or maybe you lack the intimacy and confidence of God in your daily life. And maybe you're still trying to be good, good enough, pure enough, kind enough, faithful enough to get to heaven one day. Folks, if that's the way you're living your life, you're never going to have peace. You're never going to have peace. You're never going to have joy until you stop trying to save yourself and start trusting Jesus for your salvation. Maybe you're a believer and you've trusted Christ and it's possible this morning that maybe your focus is misplaced. Maybe right now you're more interested in looking at your feet than looking at what's around you and looking at what's ahead. And you're so focused on the details of the journey that you're missing out on the benefits that you and I have in being a believer in Jesus Christ. Do you understand what a great gift that God has extended us? 
And you and I, we need to open our eyes and, and enjoy the wonder of being His children. You see, God's promise to us is real simple. Those who hope in Christ are not going to be disappointed. I, I promise you, He's everything that the Bible says He is. And He will do more for you than you can ever dream or imagine. You say, is He really that good? Is He really that? Yes, He is. He is. Don't miss the benefits of being a follower of Jesus Christ. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes with me just a moment? As we extend our invitation this morning, as always, the most important decision that you can make in life is whether you're going to put your faith and trust in Christ that you're going to allow Him to be the Lord and the Savior of your life. You may be here this morning and you've never done that. That's a miserable way to live life. You can be saved this morning. I'm going to be down front. Brother Donnie's going to be down front. And we're here to assist you. We'll be glad to share with you what you need to do in order to be saved. But don't walk out the door lost one more time. This morning, if you're a believer, and maybe you're not giving him your best, you're not, you're not enjoying the benefits of what Jesus died for you to have. Maybe you find yourself, you're following, but you're following him from a distance. Maybe you want to recommit yourself. Say, Lord, I know I'm not, I'm not living as close to you as I should. I'm not giving you my best. I'm giving you my leftovers. Why don't you recommit, rededicate yourself this morning? For some of you, maybe God's been dealing with you about your church membership. Listen, we don't ever want to manipulate anybody. We're not interested in twisting anybody's arms. Because listen, if we manipulate you here and God wants you somewhere else, guess what? You're going to be miserable. And most likely we are too. But if you know this is where God wants you to be, we would welcome you to be a part of this fellowship. If you're looking for the perfect church, Good luck with your search, because you won't find one. You say, well, why is that? Because churches are filled with imperfect people. There is no such thing as a perfect church. But if you want a church that will love you and care for you and nurture you and point you to Jesus, then heritage is that church. But if God is moving in your heart to be a part of this fellowship, we'd love to have you come and join with us here. Or this morning, maybe you've got a burden on your heart. You're, you're in the middle of one of those tribulations right now. And maybe you just need somebody to pray with you. Or maybe you just want to come and kneel down front at these steps and just pour out your heart to God. Nobody will be offended by that. We would welcome that. But in these moments of invitation, what are you to do with what you've heard today? It's, it's not to go in one ear and out the other. What does it mean to you? What are you to do with what God tells you or what he's told you to do today? I'm going to lead us in a word of prayer, and then Brother Bruce is going to come and extend our, our hymn of invitation. And uh, again, myself and Brother Donnie are going to be down front to receive you. But if God has spoken to you today, about a decision that needs to be made, not next week, not a month from now, but today, then you come. Father, we again thank you for this Lord's Day. We thank you that we have sensed your presence. We've heard your word to us today. And Father, during the invitation, I pray that each of us are asking the question, well, what do I need to do with what I've heard today? I pray that the Holy Spirit will move and speak 
in every heart, every mind, through every pew, and every platform this morning. God, I pray something would happen today that the only explanation could be that God did it. God, 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 I pray that there will be a spirit of surrender in this place today. Have your way in us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Brother Bruce is going to come and lead us. Let's stand together as we sing. And if God has spoken, times like these you need a savior in times like these you need an anchor be very sure be very sure your anchor holds and grips the solid rock this rock is Jesus, yes, he's the one. This rock is Jesus, the only one. Be very sure, be very sure. Your anchor holds and grips the solid rock. In times like these, you need the Bible. In times like these, oh, be not idle, be very sure, be very sure. Your anchor holds and grips the solid rock. This rock is Jesus, yes, he's the one. This rock is Jesus, the only one. Be very sure, be very sure. Your anchor holds and grips the solid rock. In times like these.